this computer, three, two, one. All right, everybody, welcome. Thank you for joining us today in this uh, uh, lecture or discussion of sorts with, uh, about liberation theology uh, on behalf of Philly DSA. Very excited to be joined by David Inchauskas. Now, David, I don't know if you are officially a father. Should I be calling you Father David Inchauskas or just David? Oh, David Inchauskas is fine in that I'm in the okay. Jesuit formation process. It's an 11 year process and I'm in year eight. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and David hosts this really great podcast called the Liberation Theology Podcast. Does a really great breakdown of um, of essentially the entire tenets and basic understanding of liberation theology. Its history is something that I have learned a lot from, uh, and I'm really excited about what we have planned for today. Uh, and just uh, yeah, I think I'll just uh, throw it to David. David, I think just give me a second. Let me just. Uh, yeah, you should be able to share uh, your screen. Let me know if you have any problem with doing that. Yes, I, it says uh, host disabled participant mm -hmm. screen sharing. Let's see, there we go. And try now. Now we're good. Cool. Well, Thank you so much. First of all, I want to thank uh, Sanwal. I want to thank the Philly DSA for this opportunity to have this evening together to speak about liberation theology, in particular, the context of Latin America and the way that it has influenced political movements, leftist political movements in Latin America. But before I jump into that, I do want to share a bit of my story, as I think it will be helpful in contextualizing some of the comments that I'm going to make. And so I have arranged these four photos here that more or less describe my journey through uh, liberation theology to liberation theology. And so I was uh, born in Hinsdale, Illinois, southwest suburb of Chicago. I went to Wake Forest University in North Carolina for college. In between my uh, first and second years at Wake Forest, I uh, wanted to do a project that was related to Latin America. And I partnered with a great uh, professor of Latin American studies at Wake Forest in order to end up going to Guatemala. And at that time, that was 2011, and that was a very important election season in Guatemala. Uh, it was the elections that ended up electing Otto Perez Molina, uh, who was one of the military leaders responsible for the genocide during the armed conflict in Guatemala uh, from the 1960 until the mid 1990s. So a conflict that extends into my own life, a very one of recent memory for the folks of Guatemala. And I went there to partner with a community organizing organization that was working on the human rights of women and children, uh, organizing in the villages in the mountain region of the Cuchumatanes in Guatemala. And that's what they, these folks were doing during the weekdays, but on the weekends, after we had built up a certain level of trust, they asked me, uh, David, you seem like someone who is a bit of a leftist. And I was like, yes. And they said, well, we on the weekends, we campaign for Rigoberta Menchu, uh, who was the presidential candidate at that time for the URNG Maiz Party, the National Unity Revolutionary Party of Guatemala, and Maiz, the Movimiento Amplio de Izquierda, uh, the wider movement of leftists, and uh, Rigoberta Menchu, Nobel Peace Prize winner, was campaigning herself to be president, and so I joined that campaign, and so a photo on the top left of uh, campaigning. All of us were in the back of that pickup truck uh, going from town to town on the weekends to uh, encourage people to vote for Rigoberta Menchu. She, uh, of course, lost that election, and Otto Perez Molina was elected. And I think I saw at that time a very different kind of faith. You know, I was uh, raised in the suburban Catholic environment. My mother is Catholic. My father is an atheist. My mother kind of won the battle, I guess we could say, of how I was going to be raised. And so I was raised Catholic. And um, I had always seen a kind of church uh, that was oftentimes turned in on itself, uh, sometimes that was charitable, but very often was condemnatory towards uh, leftist politics, and if not condemnatory, maybe apolitical or sought to be apolitical. And so when I went to Guatemala for this experience with the URNG Maiz, 
what I was finding is that many of the folks who were doing this amazing community organizing work during the week, who were campaigning for Rigoberta Menchu on Saturday, were also going to mass on Sunday. And it was a totally different experience of church from the one that I had, one that was a church of compromise with the masses and for the sake of their liberation. I was fascinated by this. And I, I kind of, after that experience, as I wrote about in an article for America Media, once I had that experience of liberation theology, I could not be Catholic without it. I knew that it had to be integral to my identity as a Catholic and that really without that piece, something would be missing and my faith would kind of be meaningless. Um, so one of the things that happened was that the folks in Guatemala encouraged me to learn about liberation theology, knowing that I was Catholic, that I was interested in these political movements, that I was interested in Latin America. I ended up majoring in Spanish and in religion in college. And so I began to study the guy on the top right, who was Ignacio Eacuria, my great model, uh, a Jesuit priest who, uh, though born in Spain uh, at the age of, I think, 17, moved to El Salvador and lived in El Salvador for much of the rest of his life and ended up being killed um, in an attack by the military uh, during the armed conflict in El Salvador in 1989. And so that, you know, certainly was an, in one of the influences that led me to become a Jesuit. Um, the Jesuits is a religious order, a group within the Catholic Church that focuses on faith, justice, ecology, and accompanying young people, often through education. And so Ea Korea was really one of my first encounters with the Society of Jesus. I, after I graduated from college, I, I entered the Jesuits right away. I did my first two years of novitiate in St. Paul, Minnesota, and then I uh, went on to get a master's in social philosophy, another master's in Spanish, and then now I teach at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio, both Spanish and philosophy. But what something inspired me to found the Liberation Theology podcast, and that was really the story of the man on the bottom right, Father Guadalupe Carney, also a member of the Society of Jesus, someone who had uh, gone to Honduras, saw the plight of the peasant poor in Honduras, began to do community organizing that led him into labor organizing that ultimately led him to come to believe that workers' cooperatives were not sufficient uh, in order to achieve the kind of revolution in society that he wanted to achieve and that the communities that he was with wanted to achieve. And so he ended up joining a uh, guerrilla movement. Uh, and he was first exiled and sent to Nicaragua. And then he worked for a, a couple of years at the Nicar Nicaraguan border following the Sandinista revolution. And uh, then decided, well, in Nicaragua, they're, they're doing kind of well, <laughs> he thought, that after the Sandinista revolution, they had engaged in these massive literacy camp campaigns that were bridging the gap, as uh, Marx and Engels had recommended from the Communist Manifesto and uh, what many socialists believe, you know, bridging this gap between rural communities and the cities. Um, and and uh, he thought that they were doing that very well. Whereas in Honduras, Honduras um, has never undergone the same civil war and revolution that the countries around it had faced, like Guatemala, El Salvador, and uh, Nicaragua. Honduras never had that. He wanted to be a part of that. He ended up joining kind of as a chaplain, the guerrilla forces in the Honduran um, countryside and was killed uh, as a result of engaging in that. And that together with my own journeys in 2019, I took two trips to the UCA, the Central American University where uh, on the top right, Ea Korea was uh, killed for standing in solidarity with the poor during the armed conflict in El Salvador. Um, reading that book and then also going to the place where Ea Korea had been martyred along with his Jesuit companions and uh, two lay companions really inspired me to uh, found the Liberation Theology podcast, which has been going since January of this year. So now I, well, I'll speak a little bit about Liberation Theology in general, and then I'll speak a little bit about three, we could say, um, characters or players in Liberation Theology from Chile, from Guatemala, and from Venezuela. And so 
liberation theology, uh, many liberation theologians will cite Vatican II, this worldwide meeting of the Catholic Church that took place in Rome in the 1960s as one of the founding moments of liberation theology. At that church meeting, the church declared in a very important document that the joys and hopes, griefs, and anxieties of the people of this age, especially those who are poor or in any ways afflicted, these are the joys and hopes, griefs, and, and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Now, this is an somewhat idealistic statement, right? Is it true that the joys and hopes, griefs, and anxieties of the poor are the griefs and anxieties, joys, and hopes of the followers of Christ? I would say often the case that is not true. Oftentimes, the church experience is both alienated from the poor and also alienating uh, towards the poor and marginalized communities. That's the fact of the matter. Um, however, Vatican II expressed this aspiration, the idea that the church would, would kind of open up its doors, have an update, updating. The image that is used at the time is that as if we can imagine the church being kind of this dusty old room um, with cobwebs on it, and the air is musty and kind of nasty. And Vatican II, many liberations say, was kind of an opening of the window, all right? And not only was it an opening of the window, it was an opening of the door. The idea that both let the air flow in and also let the church go out. Um, Pope Francis talks about this. He says that uh, if people don't go to church, the church has to be with the people. And Pope Francis, this amazing story, when he was the rector of the seminary, he would give the seminarians a free day to be able to go out into Buenos Aires and do whatever they wanted. And he would say that um, he would look at their shoes when they would come back at the end of the day and see, is there mud and is there dust on their shoes? Mainly, you know, do they follow this preferential option for the poor? Do they spend their free time in cafes, you know, or do they spend their free time uh, with the people in these marginalized communities, often known as pueblos jóvenes or um, asentamientos humanos on the outskirts of uh, Buenos Aires? Um, additionally, Vatican II spoke about scrutinizing the signs of the times in the light of the gospel. And what the Latin American liberation theologians saw and what the Latin American church in general saw is that the sign of the times is inhumane poverty, institutionalized injustice. This is the sign of the time, right? It is not a happy sign of the time. It's a sign of the time that follows centuries of colonization, right? And decades uh, and centuries of neo-colonization that has led to the systemic uh, marginalization, we could say, of the global South uh, Latin America being a part of it. And so the question is, what light does the gospel shine on that situation? Uh, that was kind of the question that was being asked. One of the things that emerged was a new approach to poverty. This is, I would say, just as I cite here these important quotes from Karl Marx's theses on Feuerbach, um, a similar moment, that would be a moment in philosophy, but we could say that a similar moment happened in Catholic theology um, in the 1960s and following, which was, of course, Marx said that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. And we could say that the same thing would be true of theology in this sense, that we could say before Vatican II, in some ways, poverty was interpreted. And it was interpreted in this way, that it's God's will. It's almost, we can think I'm a philosophy pro professor. So I think back to Plato and Aristotle, right? The idea that, and many students will protest against this, rightfully so, when they read Aristotle and Plato saying, you know, they pretty much thought that there's different classes of human beings, that this comes to you by your nature, and you're to be divided into either kind of the working class, the ruling class, or the soldier class, depending on your nature, which is more or less discovered early on in childhood, and that's the way that it's meant to be. Similarly, in theology, I think the idea was that God kind of ordains the natural order, and the natural order puts people into these different categories. It's just part of the universe. It's built into the way things are, the natural law, we could say. But um, there was a change. <laughs> the change, I think, that happened in 
many parts of the church, certainly not all, but many parts of the Latin American church, was the idea of almost a rediscovery of the idea that poverty is not God's will, but it is, in fact, the exact opposite. It is against the will of God as a material condition. And not only that, but Christians are called to change this situation and help in the revolution that would overturn that situation. We can think of Mary's Magnificat, this point in the Bible, when Mary basically says that God is coming to cast down the mighty from their thrones and to lift up the lowly, that God is going to collaborate with human beings in order to send the rich away empty and to fill up the poor with food, right? So that is the biblical language from the beginning of Luke's gospel. Then we get to the Beatitudes. We see, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. This present tense, right? It, that it's not necessarily only something that happens in the future, as in, let the poor um, suffer now, and then they'll have a great reward in heaven, but that that is calls upon the church to engage in a revolution in society in order to make that a reality. So we can see this kind of dialectic, we could say, taking place, just as there's a dialectic in philosophy, dialectic in theology, whereby there is kind of this Vatican II, uh, the church needs to be with the poor, uh, but that's kind of an idea, right? It, it's not necessarily the case, but we need to be moving towards that. Uh, in, a, in a way that is towards freedom and justice. Now, Gustavo Gutierrez and other liberation theologians, um, as you know, part of a social science trend uh, at the time, were beginning to think about the world kind of in this way, uh, in the terms of colonization, neo-colonization, and liberation. This is something that many of us are familiar with now, but Enrique Dussel was really one of the main liberation theologians and liberation philosophers who outlined this in his massive volumes of the church history in Latin America. And so what happens, though, is that when the church begins to engage in this kind of behavior, when for so many years, the church was really an ally and continues to be in many ways, an ally of the rich and powerful. In Althusserian terms, the church functions as an ideological state apparatus, right? That ultimately the economic conditions are at the base of society and in the last instance determine um, the infrastructure, you know, the, the, that which is built on top of that base, including religion. And we see that that's the case. Religion is used to justify the enslavement of the indigenous peoples as well as the enslavement of African peoples and how uh, the church is used in order to only reinforce, we could say, these mechanisms of injustice. But when the, so we can understand then that when the church begins to, uh, some elements of the church begin to resist this use of the gospel as an ideological um, state apparatus, it leads to resistance, right? Um, and Two of the most noteworthy, though there are many, but I'm two of the most noteworthy instances of, we could say, crucifixions, that just as Jesus Christ for preaching the things that I was just talking about, blessed are the poor, theirs is the kingdom. Well, the rich don't like to hear that because they think that theirs is the kingdom, right? Um, the Romans don't like to hear the idea that the powerful, uh, the mighty are going to be cast down from their thrones, right? If you're the Roman emperor, you're not going to like that. And in fact, it is the case that when um, even, even Pontius Pilate, you know, this horrible uh, crucifying figure, kind of at one point, it seems in the gospel was trying to, you know, let Jesus off the hook and say, you know, I don't think that he deserves to die. What, what did the high priests and Pharisees and folks encourage the people to shout? There is only one emperor. There is only one king. It is Caesar. Right. And this man is going around and saying that he is king, right? And that he's setting up a different kingdom. So that led to the crucifixion of Jesus, right? That he was seen as being a revolutionary figure, a, a revolter against that status quo. And it led to his death. So we can see that throughout Christian history, 
there are instances, this is the thread that inspires me in Christian history, when so much of Christian history is a history of oppression and use of Christianity for evil purposes, there is throughout Christian history, this thread that can be traced back to that interpretation of the ministry of Jesus. Oscar Romero, this powerful and, and gory and difficult photo on the bottom left, uh, Oscar Romero was saying mass at the, uh, at, while he was uh, shot and killed, gunned down while he was in the middle of saying mass. Why is this? Well, one of the main reasons is that just the day before, he said the words on the left over the radio. He had a radio program. And he said, he told soldiers, you have been given an order by your military authority. And that order sometimes is to kill people. And I am telling you, this is what God says. Thou shalt not kill, right? And that the name of these peoples, uh, the, these peoples who are crying out for justice, who are crying out just to live, right? In all of these revolutionary movements that took place in Central America, we can cite the Guatemalan example. It seems that 93%, according to the reports of the Truth and Reconciliation Com Commission, 93% of the killings during these armed conflicts took place at the hands of the state. Only about 3% of the killings uh, took place at the hands of guerrilla groups. And then there is a small percentage that are kind of unidentified killings. So the vast majority of all of these cases in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, and in Guatemala, the state and the military and the capitalist class is precisely the one that's carrying out most of the murders. And so Oscar Romero says, stop the repression over the radio with thousands, you know, thousands of people listening over the radio. And of course, that uh, pissed off the authorities very much so to the point that they then shot him. I've been to that chapel where Oscar Romero was shot and killed and had a powerful prayer experience uh, in that chapel. And I remember very clearly that God seemed to be saying to me at that time, David, I, um, I want you to preach and teach and live and work for justice in a way that is your own, but in a way that follows in the footsteps of Oscar Romero. And that is, I mean, <laughs> we, we fail, but we try, you know, and that's the goal. That's, that's certainly the goal with my own Christian ministry is to follow in this great tradition of liberation theology. Now, Oscar Romero was killed in 1980. And nine years later, Ignacio Eacaria, my great role model who I shared about before, was also killed. And we can see the photo on the right where he and five of his Jesuit com companions and uh, their two lay companions who worked in the house where they lived were all assassinated in the middle of the night. Uh, there were more, I, th I think the number is around 300 or so military uh, members surrounded the Central American University in the dead of the night, in the early hours of the morning, a small contingent of that group of soldiers went into the uh, area, the Jesuit compound, we could say the area where the Jesuits live, and knocked on the door and basically drug the Jesuits out of their room and assassinated them execution style on the garden lawn in front of their building. And now right behind this photo, kind of where the photo is being taken um, in the bottom right, behind is one of the rooms uh, where one of the Jesuits uh, lived. And I had the kind of horrifying and difficult, but also moving experience of staying in that very room uh, the first time that I went to the Uka. So from the window of that room, you're looking out at the very place where these Jesuits were murdered execution style on their front lawn. And that, that again, a, a very powerful experience um, in my own life journey. But on the right, I want to point out the fact that a few years before Ea Korea's murder, he gave a talk at Santa Clara University in California, one of our Jesuit institutions. 
and said these words on the right, which I'll summarize as, as following. Uh, how is it that so many of our poor are being massacred and yet the priests are not dying with their people, right? The priest, like Pope Francis says, is meant to smell like the sheep. The pastor should smell like the sheep is the words that Pope Francis says, right? Just as good, a good, you know, we could say community organizer, you know, is with the people, is in dialogue with the people, uh, learns from the people, uh, understands what the desires of the people are, allies oneself with the people. Um, so too should a good shepherd be. And Romero used to say, why is it that many of our priests are not dying? It's because they're coming from a place of privilege and they do not uh, offer solidarity with the working class, uh, with the indigenous, with marginalized communities in Central America. So isn't it, isn't it, you know, as weird as it is to say, he would basically say, isn't it a shame that our priests don't die with the people? And this is precisely what Ea Correa said uh, at that talk at Santa Clara, right? And then, of course, moving for me that he would then pay the price, you know, for precisely that. And it motivates me. I, I'm sure that some of y'all work in universities or in education. And uh, that last quote, a university that fights for justice must necessarily be persecuted. When one puts skin in the game, one... Uh, is persecuted. And I would say that I've only experienced this in minor ways, but for saying the things that I do and speaking the way that I do, of course, people call for your resignation. They call for you to be fired and, um, and things like that. And of course, we see in Romero and Ea Correa that that is, uh, is of course expanded to the nth degree. Now, I'll go very briefly through this. We could say that there are four main stages in Latin American liberation theology. Um, the first one is that period between Vatican II and Medellin. Medellin was a conference of the Latin American bishops where they said some very important things like in church documents, the word neocolonialism is used in church documents of that time. Very important. The idea that there is no peace if there's no justice, kind of those kind of ideas were the ones that began to be articulated at that time in religious circles in Latin America. Then we have Gustavo Gutierrez's book, A Theology of Liberation, which is of course an amazing text. I think it's up there behind me. Um, and then we have kind of this amazing period that extends, and I'll get into this in a second, from Salvador Allende's um, uh, democratically elected communist government, uh, a coalition, but nonetheless a communist government in Chile to uh, Puebla, which was also uh, 1979, which was also the year of the Sandinista revolution. So this time in which we could say that uh, socialists gain uh, power, uh, in one case through electoral politics, in another case through a violent revolutionary struggle um, in Chile and then in Nicaragua, respectively. And then, of course, we have the, the important time in liberation theology, which was the time when now that the Sandinistas in Nicaragua were in power and that we saw Marxists and Christians walking hand in hand in the streets following this revolutionary movement, of course, the question was that that was going to be tested, um, that hence that word conflict, because the conflict um, comes, of course, from the Contra war in Nicaragua, but then also, we could say it comes in now that we have power, how do we govern, right? How does a revolutionary government govern? Uh, and learning from the mistakes and successes of the past, of course, and maturation that takes place there. We see that bottom right photo, uh, certainly one of the most interesting photos for me would be of Ernesto Cardenal uh, with Fidel Castro and, and, and Ernesto Cardenal ended up serving in the Sandinista government. So there were, there were uh, three priests who served in the Sandinista government, uh, which was, is kind of unheard of, right? And of course, Ernesto Cardenal, un unheard of, maybe we could say, um, in the sense that, of course, there were priests who had served in powerful positions in government in the past, but unheard of in the sense that 
we have this alliance between a revolutionary church uh, and a revolutionary government, right? Which is, is different. I think certainly in my experience, growing up in the Midwest of the United States, something like that would have been totally unheard of and totally off my radar. I also wanna point out this quote, uh, just briefly summarizing it from Gustavo Gutierrez. Gustavo Gutierrez, and maybe this is something that could be of motivation for the Democratic Socialists of America, was that Gustavo Gutierrez was clear in that book. He says that we need a social revolution and we need to be moving towards a different society and he says, a socialist society, right? So he's very clear about that in the book, that that is what we are moving towards. Um, and of course, for those words, he would face uh, chastising, just as Ernesto Cardenal faced chastising for serving in the revolutionary Sandinista government. Now, I want to speak briefly about some, uh, I think, you know, talking with Sanwal, that some folks are aware of Lula. Um, some folks may be aware of other important uh, figures like Evo Morales in contemporary uh, politics in Latin America. But I want to point to three moments that may be a little bit less well known. Um, the first one would be relating to the government of Salvador Allende in Chile in the early 1970s, that at the time of right around the time of Salvador Allende taking power, there was a group of 80 priests in uh, the Chilean church who wrote this very powerful document in 1971. It was called the Declaration of the 80. And it speaks very clearly about economics, saying socialism, which is characterized by social appropriation of the means of production. Um, and then also we feel committed to the process that is now underway, saying in a loose way, not in a very official like rara Salvador Allende, but they're saying we feel committed to this process. We're going to critique the process as we see fit along the way, but we're committed to this process and we want it to succeed. We want to contribute to its success. And that the reason for that is the faith in Jesus Christ. So very powerful document. And one of the priests who was behind that movement which was called Christians for Socialism, which was not only a priest-led movement, but a lay-led movement um, that was very powerful at that time and that, of course, was condemned by the institutional church, uh, Pablo Richard. On the right, this very powerful photo, another one of my favorite books uh, written by Marta uh, Harnaker, this book from 1978. She refers to a letter that she received from the uh, renowned French socialist Luis Althusser, with whom she had studied. And in that letter, she kind of asks, you know, uh, Marta Harnaker was a revolutionary um, uh, Catholic uh, student leader that, who participated in what was called the Catholic Action Movement, which was a lay-led movement of the church taking um, its role in society and politics, kind of as it was determined that basically the you know, clergy should kind of avoid uh, being involved in politics and rightfully so, I would say. Um, but also uh, the lay that, that Catholics should participate in the political life of the country in which they live and should bring the principles of Catholic social teaching to that political environment. And basically what Luis Althusser said in that letter, himself a Catholic, uh, raised Catholic and a uh, very important figure in, in the relationship between Marxism and Catholicism, says in that letter that Marxism is not an atheist uh, system in the sense that more so what Marxism is concerned about is the use of religion as an ideological state apparatus, right? But when religion is not that opiate, when it, it is not uh, that ideological state apparatus and the capitalist mode of production, religion can be a very powerful force of unity. That's the same conclusion that Fidel Castro came to in one of his famous quotes where he basically said, I think the time has come for Christians to participate in the revolution. And, uh, and we see that, of course, most powerfully in, Sandi in the Sandinista revolution, where Marta Harnaker says that she remembered that letter from Luis Althusser when she saw Marxists and Christians marching together in the revolutionary processes of Central America. So those two kind of moments of liberation theology in Chile 
in Pablo Richard and Marta Harnaker. Then this one is, of course, more personal to me in that it pertains to Rigoberta Menchu, for whom you know, I campaigned uh, on, in that summer experience in 2011 in Guatemala. If those, I'm guessing some people are familiar with the story of Rigoberta Menchu, but um, some may not be. I definitely recommend her book, uh, I, Rigoberta Menchu, for those who would like to learn more about her story. But she was born in 1959. And of course, there was a coup, I believe, in 1954 in Guatemala against the Arpens government um, that essentially boiled down to the uh, U.S. plantation owners in the banana plantations and other exotic fruit plantations. Some of their land was expropriated um, or rightfully restored. Uh, to indigenous peoples in a, an agrarian reform government. And that led to the coup uh, that was sponsored by the United States in the mid-1950s, and then eventually to the beginning of the armed conflict in 1960. So she was one year old when this conflict begins. When she was at the age of seven, she began working as a child laborer in some of these agricultural uh, labors, she lost many of her family members. Some of her family members were lost due to poisoning of the fields in which they worked, where there used to be these airplanes that would spray uh, with pesticides in order to you know, kind of kill off insects and preserve the crops, but also that would kill human beings. She lost one of her family members uh, to that, and then also lost her uh, brother, uh, sister, father, um, mother to the revolutionary struggle, some more actively participating in guerrilla movements than others. I believe her father was burned alive after um, engaging in a, an occupation of an embassy, I believe the Spanish embassy in Guatemala City. So this history of trauma, right, this history of trauma, but despite that trauma, or maybe because of that trauma, we could say Rigoberta was motivated to all the more engage in the process of the liberation of indigenous peoples from colonial, neo-colonial, and even domestic oppression at the hands of the state and its U.S.-backed sponsors. And so she engaged in organizing in order to advocate for the rights of the indigenous people in Guatemala. For that, she was sent into exile into Mexico, where she was received by a Catholic bishop uh, who, who wanted to support her work and put her up uh, so that she would have a place to stay. She would return to Guatemala many times and would be sent into exile many times. But her father was Catholic and mother, an indigenous uh, spirituality uh, practitioner. And she says that she was the perfect blend of these two, uh, which, is, which is wonderful to see when in so many parts of the Catholic Church, it seems that these, uh, there is such an opposition. And even sometimes the idea is that if one has an indigenous spirituality, that it is you know, frowned down upon and maybe one is not fully Catholic if one engages in that kind of spirituality. We see in her this uh, blending and she drew, draws, uh, draws and drew from both of these traditions. One of the things that she engaged in was liberation theology's well-known ecclesial base communities or Christian base communities, which is where groups from the working class would read passages of the Bible together and then relate them to their experience. So they may be reading that great passage where Mary says that uh, the rich will be sent away empty-handed and the poor will be filled with good things and they will interpret that passage in light of their reality. They may be reading the passages of scripture in which uh, Moses and God, uh, together with the Hebrew people, are liberated from slavery in Egypt, right? Uh, so these powerful passages of liberation read together in community and related to the daily struggle of that community for the sake of its liberation. And there's a powerful documentary that um, Rigoberta Menchu narrates called When the Mountains Tremble, War and Revolution in Guatemala from 1983, and would encourage uh, watching that. Very powerful. I can't get through it without crying. I can't also get through it without being fired up. Lastly, um, I want to, and maybe we can end here after a prayer just so that there's time for some dialogue. 
uh, is the case of Venezuela and Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. A uh, very powerful image on the bottom left, for sure. This uh, Last Supper that was a mural and that features Jesus at the center. To the right of Jesus is Karl Marx, and to the left of Jesus is Simon Bolivar, uh, a libertador uh, of, we could say, the northern part of South America, and other revolutionary figures uh, surrounding Jesus. These kinds of images, if one goes to Venezuela, one will see um, really all over the place in, in Caracas, different images of revolutionary Jesus, revolutionary Mary, and Hugo Chavez was very much so engaged in spirituality, both um, indigenous spiritual practices as well as Catholic spiritual practices, sometimes charismatic Catholic, kind of Pentecostal-esque uh, Christian practices. And I have this quote from First Things, which is a conservative-oriented uh, Catholic magazine, but I think it highlights a point that we can then turn on its head is this writer, uh, Lisa Carol Davis, is, of course, this quote is in spite, right? It's saying this is horrible. On the anniversary of Chavez's death, the current Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, declared that Christ, the Redeemer, became flesh, became spirit, became truth in Chavez, and was the Christ of the poor, the Christ of the humble, he who came to protect those who have had nothing. Now, as a Jesuit, I certainly um, don't endorse any particular political uh, parties or governments um, wholeheartedly and want to make that clear here. Um, I want to say also that there is a certain liberation theology-esque-ness to this statement of Nicolas Maduro, which is the idea that Christ came, this, this could be the central idea of liberation theology, that Christ came to be with humanity and to establish on earth the reign of God, the reign of God. This reign of God, which as we know from the Beatitudes belongs to the poor. We could say should belong to the poor or is belonging to the poor through revolutionary action. And Christ died for that vision of the reign of God and was resurrected to overturn the system of injustice that had condemned him to a wrongful death but then turned over that mission to the church, right? Uh, that the church would be a leaven in society to, in solidarity with the, we can imagine the poor uh, as this loaf of bread that is about to be baked and that Christianity would be that leaven, which helps lift up. Um, that is the vision. And so is it a bad thing? to see human beings who are doing good things as little Christs. I think it is not a bad thing. <laughs> In fact, the word Christian means little Christ, right? <laughs> so that's kind of the goal. <laughs> My favorite Chilean Jesuit, St. Alberto Hurtado, used to say that the goal of the Christian should be to be another Christ. And uh, maybe we can end with that, along with uh, this prayer that I would invite uh, those who would like to pray with me, and um, then we can move into some question, answer, and discussion. So I invite you all to pray with me. Let us center ourselves in our spirit at this time. God of justice, executed by the Roman Empire and Pontius Pilate in the first century. God of justice, executed by the American Empire in the 20th century, pierced by Roman nails, shot by American bullets, suffocated and inundated by capital's emissions, who moves prophets to denounce evil and announce visions of righteousness, who casts down the mighty and lifts up the poor, who lived in our brother, St. Oscar Romero, who suffered and died with him and with Ignacio Eucaria and with so many more women and men who died in union with the poor, and who will rise with them on the last day. Liberate the oppressed, overturn the tables of greed and power, and reign on earth as you do in heaven. Amen.
Amen, indeed. Okay. Uh, all right, let's thank you for that great lecture, David. Um, moving on to Q&A, I wanted to start out with something that I actually had a question about myself, and that was Catholic social teaching. Now that comes from, I think, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, and I asked that specifically because you will see, you know, characters like Marco Rubio often use Catholic social teaching to promote his brand of like, oh, I'm like so for the workers and the oppressed and the poor. But when it comes to, you know, voting for a $15 minimum wage or healthcare for all, he's nowhere to be found. Well, how is liberation theology, if at all, different from Catholic teaching, or Catholic social teaching, and what can we learn from? The differences between those two. Absolutely. And before I say anything on that, I would like to say we do have two episodes of Liberation Theolo Theology podcast, which are dedicated to this question. We have a great guest, Dr. Marcus Mesher, my um, colleague here at Xavier. We discuss precisely that question. Certainly different liberation theologians have different relationships to Catholic social teaching. Some liberation theologians will rely on Catholic social teaching when it is helpful. And oftentimes it is helpful in this sense. There are some Catholic social teachings, for example, of Pope Francis. Um, so this is a tradition for those who may not be familiar. Catholic social teaching oftentimes refers to that document um, that Sanwal was referring to from Pope Leo um, from the late 19th century, a living tradition that is sustained into the present. Popes will put out and what are called encyclical letters, letters to the faithful and sometimes to the whole world where they will write about uh, social things, right? Now, one of the principles of Catholic social teaching, which is one that we would, as liberation theologians, be like, rah, rah, that's good, which is the prioritization of the universal destination of goods over private property. And what this means is that private property is only a secondary and derived right, that the primary right is for everyone on the earth to use all of the goods of the earth, right? And as, um, as socialists, that is something that is attractive, right? Um, to the liberation theologians who identify as socialists. Some liberation theologians identify as socialists, other liberation theologians have not. Like Air Korea was pretty famous for saying that Capitalism is much worse than socialism. Um, socialism maybe is not fully in compatibility with a Catholic social teaching and with the Catholic church, but it's way better. And so that's why we are more aligned with socialism than with capitalism. Other liberation theologians are just pretty much, we're socialist. Um, so there's, there's some differences there. So that is something that can be used. One of the issues with Catholic, Catholic social teaching is that it's such a vast tradition that spans decades and now centuries, like three centuries of teaching, the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries, right? And so you can pick, you can cherry pick anything from that, Sanwal. <laughs> you can cherry pick it and you can make it what you want. So I think that what liberation theology does is it relies on the social sciences to a great degree. And this is where you'll find liberation theologians quite uh, quoting social scientists, quoting Marx and Engels, quoting Lenin, quoting Che, quoting different figures who are important in social, economic, and political philosophy. So, and I would say part of this is, of course, the magisterium of the Catholic Church. You know, the Catholic Church is this massive institution, right? Um, that is, some people want a big tent in the Catholic Church, right? I'm sure it's something that y'all struggle with in, in the democratic socialists of America, right? What do we allow? What, like, what fits under our umbrella, right? And I think the same thing is true in the Catholic church, like what fits? So sometimes Catholic social teaching more appeals to that broadness, um, whereas liberation theology is more specific and more contextual. One of the things that Marcus Mesher points out, which is, I think, a good one to point out, is that, you know, um, Catholic social teaching is written from Rome, Liberation theology is written from Peru, from El Salvador, from you know Guatemala. So there's a different experience um, there between those two. So yeah, check out those two episodes for sure for more in-depth discussion. But I would say for me, uh, use it when it's helpful. It's it is helpful many times. Um, 
And of course, as theologians and philosophers, I think there's a role that is to be played that the church is always growing and expanding. So there can be a critical edge to theology and philosophy. And sometimes it's important to have that critical edge and make corrections where necessary. Great, thank you for that answer, David. Moving on to audience questions. Um, so Larry asked a question, what is your response to the statement that religion is the opiate of the masses? This is something I often see people, you know, like super edgy, like, they're like, oh, op religion is like the opiate of the masses, man. Like they've never actually read Marx. Uh, Marx, when he's saying that statement is meaning a lot more than that. How do you and liberation theologians see this statement? Yes. And many liberation theologians write to this point. And I think the first thing to do is to acknowledge that that is the case. <laughs> in, many, in many cases, that is precisely the case. Um, and it is so sad and frustrating. I remember being in a church in Honduras. Um, this in particular, it was a, a Pentecostal church, but it happens in the Catholic church too, but I'm just gonna speak from my life experience. Next to me was a boy who had cerebral palsy and, um, and I was sitting next to him and the preacher was going on and on and on about how all diseases are caused by personal sins. You know, you sin, you get sick. And I was, it, it made me cry. It was the worst. It, it, when you see theology being used in that way in order to justify error, injustice, oppression, and not only from that systemic level, but making individual people feel horrible about who they are. Um, and, and we see that over and over and over again. So the first thing to do is to say that is the way that it is a lot of times. Then I think the next thing to do is to say that's not how it has to be. And can I militate against precisely against that? And I think that's what liberation theology attempts to do is to militate against that. And to do what Althusser said, that when, re when religion gets in the way of social revolution in the positive sense, it should be cast aside, qua getting in the way. But when, it can, when it's not getting in the way and when it's contributing, then amen. You know, I think yeah. that, that's maybe my short answer to that. Okay, great. Um, let's see what else. Oh, and, and while I'm scrolling the questions, the actual, the full quote, if you read Marx, it's religion is the opium of the people. It is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless, heart of a heartless world and the soul of our soulless conditions. So he's not, you know, completely just you know, trying to punch down on religion. Mm -hmm. uh, Another question, what is your explanation of the cult-like idolization by many poor and uneducated in this nation of Donald Trump? If you have anything Ooh. to add. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I would just say that this also shook me uh, to the core is in this very room where I am. You know, January 6th was in... Um, to me, it was like a boiling, you know, it was like simmering and you could sense, I could sense, like maybe many of y'all could, that, that we were reaching a tipping point, that like something was going to happen and it wasn't going to be a good thing. And I remember seeing three types of signs. One was Jesus signs, you know, Jesus is our savior, massive crosses that you saw in the January 6th movement. That's one. You also saw anti-communism. I remember there's this famous picture that came out on in many media outlets. I don't know if it was an AP picture, but it's like communism is the real virus where you're just like, oh my God, there's, where do you begin? There's so many layers of error and, and ignorance and frustration there. So that's frustrating. Then of course the racism and that, that is part of uh, the white supremacy that is involved in that January 6th movement and Donald Trump movement in general. So you see the intersection of all of these forces in history that are kind of red scare uh, forces, we could say. Um, and it is frustrating. Now, 
I think the question that emerges is, you know, how do we proceed? How do we proceed? And this is something that I'm working on. I'm at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, Ohio is not uh, Chicago, where I was before at Loyola University, Chicago. Cincinnati is not Chicago. It's a different environment. Whereas I would say about 90% of my students would identify as progressive, liberal, socialist, communist, anarchist at Loyola, Chicago. Here at Xavier, that number is much lower. It's about 50-50. So I am constantly you know, dealing with and working with alongside students. Now, in one of my philosophy classes, I, the students are allowed to choose the books that they are going to read. We vote as a class on them. One of the books that the students selected was Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth. And there were some students who were moved by that reading. They were exposed to something they had never thought of before. And at the end of that, there were some students who came up to me and, and said, um, before reading Fanon, I thought that never should any kind of violence, you know, whether it's property destruction or destruction of you know, capitalists uh, themselves, would be appropriate. But now I see that in some cases, this is the only way for people to defend themselves and their lives. Whoa, <laughs> for, a, for a student who I know very well, who's con conservative to say something like that, was a transformational moment. So I would say, as opposed to the demonization, which one can understand that and can see that, I think that there is an opportunity to educate um, and to engage in a dialogue with folks. So that's my initial answer, but okay. I, it's a tough, it's a yeah. tough one. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the next question is, what are the implications of liberation theology on organizing efforts here in the U.S.? Right. I think this could be one of the strengths of the DSA is that there are caucuses that allow for the participation of religious groups. And I think that that allyship is important, right? Never to alienate a population that could be your ally. <laughs> I think that's huge, right? So um, I, think, I think, yeah, that, maybe that's number one. And, and I think it's something that DSA, from, from my experience, kind of is, is pretty advanced on that front. Like having an event like this uh, is something that in some circles of organizing probably would be looked down upon as, as you know, cooperating with the church and enemy, where I would say to folks on the left that I am eager to cooperate and to yeah. participate, you know, and so why alienate? Now, the other thing is this is something liberation theologians will harp on a lot, and rightfully so, I think, is the vast majority of the people in the universe believe in God or some form of yeah. spirituality, like the vast majority. Um, and so to meet people there, you know, and, and to see how in these ways that I've described, like here in these three movements, in Chile, in, in Guatemala, and um, in Venezuela, religion has been a force that has been used uh, and, and collaborated with the left to means, to ends that have been kind of successful in various important ways. So I would say that would be the key is, is to work with. And I, I feel like Christians have much to learn from uh, leftists and vice versa. Love is more important than faith. Uh, and I'm not saying that to be like scandalizing. It's like just what the Bible says. <laughs> Love is more important than faith. Like show me your faith through your deeds. Right. Um, and so where people can collaborate on a similar project, like we want to be doing that and we want to be grateful for that and, and encouraging that kind of work. So, yeah. Okay, uh, and let's see. Next one is, isn't one worldism or internationalism the ultimate solution to restoring dignity to each individual and blur the differences between them? I mean, I think yes, to answer that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I yeah, w w we need to have an international perspective. If we do not have an international perspective, 
I would say there are two main outcomes that I would see, which is that the economic inequality that exists between nations is only going to grow. And not only that, but we're all going to perish uh, because of global uh, climate change. And so we need to have a, an internationalist. We need to have an anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist, which is part of that eco revolution. You know, I mean, that's just to me a given. And I would say this, this is my personal strategy. I'm open to correcting it. <laughs> I may be wrong about this, but I think that there's two things is that there are pressure points in certain um, co colonized and neo-colonized countries that are at a breaking point. Um, and we want to ally ourselves with some of those movements. I would say Honduras would be a place that is at a breaking point in that Juan Orlando Hernandez, the dictator of Honduras is stepping stepping down. I mean, I don't know how you want yeah. to put that. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of weird, but he's, you know, he after cooing himself, we could say he is stepping down and there's going to be elections. Now, can we trust electoral politics in Honduras? Uh, no, hard no, but there is hope there for this upcoming organizing season. Now, at the same time as we're doing that, um, work and allying ourselves with that work, I think we also need to be doing a second thing, which is right now, the imperialist world is like, has a chokehold on the imperialized world, right? And I think to some degree, we as those in the United States who care about and want to be in solidarity with internationally oppressed communities, we want to maybe it seems difficult for us to just like tear that hand away, <laughs> but we can definitely like loosen, like I think we, we can do some things um, to loosen that chokehold. And, and to the extent that we do that, it will enable uh, revolutionary movements in other countries to be more successful. Like if we're not constantly arming those who are oppressing domestically in other countries, and if we're not, you know, basically starving the rest of the world and impoverishing the rest of the world, people will maybe have better conditions to be able to organize. So I think we need to be doing those two things simultaneously. That's my, that's my theory, <laughs> okay. but I don't know what other think. And I'm happy to learn from others because I definitely don't have that set in stone, but I think that that's a way of beginning. The next one is the idea of sharing wealth and power uh, with the poor and powerless. Why is it so threatening to the wealthy so much so that they have created they have created a, a military industrial complex to make sure they don't do it? Mm. Well, I would say from the perspective of the church is that the church is seen as an ally to the wealthy. I, there is a key moment in Oscar Romero's life, which is portrayed in the movie Romero, uh, where rich people will ask you to do things for them in a special way. They want special things from the church, right? They want you as the pastor to go with them, to dine with them, to baptize their children, to marry them, to basically be their friend and for you to be in their pocket. That's just the way it is. <laughs> It's exper I've experienced it, and especially those I know of my brothers, Jesuit brothers in Latin America, they experience this all the time as well. And Romero at the beginning was an ally of some of these rich and powerful people, and they would ask him for a special baptism. And then you can be spending as a priest your entire life catering for the bourgeois needs, the bourgeois church needs, <laughs> right? But when you then say to someone, Oh no, everyone is going to go through the same baptismal process and come to the church on Saturday at 3 p.m. to have their children baptized. And the rich have to wait in line for the baptisms with the poor. They do not like that. Um, and they want special treatment, right? They want the church to be in their back pocket. And the church wants them to be in their pocket, <laughs> right? <laughs> to fund the church operations. So it is a huge risk, but 
a risk that is important, which is a risk that led to the death of Romero and Ea Correa and others, to um, break that chain uh, and say, I am no longer going to be in the pocket of the rich and powerful. And I think, of course, when this happens, then oppression and violence escalates, as the question suggests, right? Because when you begin to chip away at the ideological state apparatuses, then the rich and powerful are going to rely on the rep repressive state apparatuses, right? They're going to throw all the more legal and military and police action at you, right? Because if there's a powerful religious left, then all the more so like people aren't being indoctrinated into bad religion, right? And when they're not being indoctrinated into bad religion, the rich and powerful are gonna find that their support and the ideological support that they've had is just kind of being chipped away at. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, uh, question next one we have from Brittany. In your experience, do you find that American Catholics are uh, hesitant or opposed to liberation theology? If so, why do you think this, this is? Could it be the inherent capitalist ideals indoctrinated in American culture slash education? Oh yeah, oh yeah. The United States has been at the heart of a movement against liberation theology in recent times. There's no doubt about that. Um, even the United States, the United States is not, some important segments in the church in the United States are not willing to put up with Pope Francis, who says basic things about human dignity and like goodness and has an anti uh, colonizing critique, which is an important one. I mean, liberation theology, like, so let, like, let alone liberation theology, right, which is maybe saying some things that may be more even more radical than what uh, Pope Francis is saying, oftentimes is more radical than what Pope Francis is saying. So of course, there are elements, I mean, I, when I had my personal Twitter account um, and, and, you know, I wanted to focus on the liberation theology Twitter account and this work and for it to be more clear that this is about the work of liberation theology and not about the work of David and Chowska. So I got rid of my, you know, personal, but before that, oh man, you receive death threats. You receive constant uh, critiques from the right and even from the center. Because from the center, and this is a, an important thing that I think you as DSA are familiar with, the center can be a powerful obstacle as well. Because, you know, it's like the church shouldn't be left, it shouldn't be right, it shouldn't be this, it shouldn't be that, it should just be dead in the middle, which ends up just preserving the status quo. And when you begin to say things against the upper class, people will say, you're being divisive. <laughs> you're being divisive, you're dividing the church. So yes, I think that's what it is. We are indoctrinated into this from the church and from society. And that is the dominant view. It's the dominant view that led to the election of Joe Biden. <laughs> because what happened is that there were more radical voices on the left, even in electoral politics. But I'll tell you, even many folks I know who are leftists, um, so-called, they said, I'm not going to vote for Bernie because he would never win in a general election, you know, um, and that's the kind of thing that is said. So, yeah, I think the question is getting at something that is important and it's real and it's something that we have to change. That's why I want the Liberation Theology podcast to reach people and for people to see this alternative and for it to grow. Like, we need a movement um, in the worldwide church, but also we need a movement in the United States, like within the heart of the belly of the beast, you know, we need to have this critique. Um, and, and I think, like I said, it can help loosen that stranglehold. Great. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, next one is, okay, that's a, this is a compliment and a question. Uh, the compliment is I see Christianity differently now as a liberatory practice based on your lecture. And the question is, how, do, how can we reconcile the inherently oppressive, violent, colonizing history of Christianity, especially in South America, with liberation theology? Yes. What did the evildoer of the week 
uh, oppressor of the weak, uh, Christopher Columbus, say in his journal, he says that wealth, he, well, he said, gold is great because it gets you all of the material possessions that you want. And wealth is also good because you can get into heaven by being wealthy. And what he meant by that was that you can pay for indulgences, right? Oh, this is, this gets at maybe I would say what is the most powerful part of all of this for me, which is that as a Catholic raised in the Midwest in the United States, um, I was not exposed in the church to a critique of the church, <laughs> right? You're exposed in the church as being a good thing. Like the church is great. Even sometimes the idea is that the church, you know, needs to evangelize. The church needs to spread its ideas to others. Um, I think that in the society of Jesus, we are finding that this is a very toxic mentality in some ways. When the salvation of souls is put prior to the people's material salvation. Many liberation theologians said that salvation is primary, primarily material. It is caring for people's material needs. That's what salvation is. Of course, that entails a revolutionary mentality. Now, um, the Society of Jesus engaged in the slave trade, both from Africa from Latin America and from the United States. So, for, so we had Jesuits who were in Africa uh, helping with the enslavement of, uh, of Black folks in, in Africa and helping with the shipping uh, of these folks to the, uh, the Western Hemisphere. So that is a horrible history that has not been uh, repaired. And then in the United States, of course, the Society of Jesus uh, held uh, enslaved people. It, we've seen this in, of course, the Georgetown, which is the most famous case of this, uh, where some enslaved people were sold so that Georgetown could pay its debts and build new buildings and expand and be the university that it is today, right? One of the top elite universities that is forming presidents and Supreme Court justices. So we have a deep reckoning to do and a conversion to do. What did Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel. What does this mean? It means change and believe in the gospel, the good news of the poor. Change and believe in the good news of the poor. That's Jesus' central message that he went about saying, boy, do we need it because the society of Jesus is steeped in privilege and a history of racism and colonization. And so we need to engage in this work. This work is being done and needs to be advanced. Um, the society of Jesus has established and has already um, begun this work regarding the case of Georgetown and other cases throughout the United States. It wasn't just the Maryland province of the Society of Jesus, but other parts of the Society of Jesus in the United States. Then we have the problem of the uh, indigenous schools, which is so in the news these days, but is a part of indigenous history in the United States and Canada and other places that is being examined more critically by some spheres at the present time. And the Jesuits have participated in that history as well in tragic ways where we, in some cases, uh, forbade indigenous uh, peoples from speaking their languages in school and forced them to speak only English uh, or French or whatever it, the language was being taught at the school at that time. There has been, there is now a truth and justice commission that's been established for the Society of Jesus to look at that in conjunction with stakeholders uh, represented in a meaningful way from the indigenous community. So all of this work needs to be done, but it need, in my opinion, it needs to be done in a systemic way, and it needs to be done also at the heart of the church is power, which is the Vatican. The church needs to have a systemic approach to decolonization and repairing the history of its colonial and neocolonial past. And we should be 11 in that process. Um, 
reparations in the United States are being discussed. I think that reparations should, if the church is to be 11, which it's obviously not, most cases the church is like that which kills the bread. But if the church is to be 11, we should do it first. We should, before, before the state does it, we should do it. That's my opinion. Um, we should do it and we should do it now. And we should do it with meaningful indigenous representation um, where those where those folks who have who are have borne the brunt of this history are dictating the conditions under which this process occurs. So that that's what I think needs to happen, and I don't think it should happen piecemeal at all. Um, I think it should happen in a systemic way because when it's done piecemeal, um, you know, the Society of Jesus, we may be doing our thing, but the church is a system, and what started as a system needs to be undone as a system. Great. Um, Irvin, just to make sure we get to everybody's questions, we still have 12 open questions. So I think we're going to stop taking any more questions just to make sure we can get to all of them, or at least most of them. Uh, next question is from Aaron. Um, is, is liberation theology a purely Christian movement, or are there any extant connections or attempts to make so connections, connections in solidarity with other communities of faith? Yes, absolutely, there are. Um, this is an area that I do not know very much about. I know that it exists. I know that in particular, a lot of amazing work is being done. There, there was a meeting, in fact, I believe in the 1980s, that was a meeting of Muslim and Catholic liberation theologians, which is a very powerful and important meeting. It, it's just a part of liberation theology that I don't know so much about. And so I don't wanna comment on it any further than that. <laughs> But I know it is happening and is happening in powerful ways, and that there are some scholars, you know, I could point to. So if anyone wants to reach out to me, you can send a, a message. The DMs are open on the Liberation Theology Podcast Twitter, and also my email is there on the Liberation Theology Podcast Twitter. So if you're interested in that topic, I do know of some of the people who are doing that work, but I just don't know so much about it myself. If folks are more interested in learning about it. Sorry, thank you. Uh, next question also from Aaron. History of, sorry, the history of opposition to liberation theology has clearly been very violent. Any ideas, any, and the ideas of liberation theology seem to me uh, outside of Christianity to be the most natural lessons from the Christian Bible. Have there been any actual contemporary arguments after Vatican II against the ideas of liberation theology? Oh, yes. Uh, so, this has come again from, we could say, the heart of power of the church and that the Catholic Church has a special committee, which is called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, also known as the CDF, which is, we could call it, it, it plays an important role, but also we could say colloquially that it's kind of the ideology police within the church in which they say when someone writes something or does something that is out of line from their perspective with Christian theology, then um, uh, they're reprimanded and kind of called to task. Now, I think that's important and that there should be a living dialogue in that way. Um, however, uh, some liberation theologians have taken it in different ways, right? Some liberation theologians have had a willingness to engage in that dialogue and to be quote unquote corrected or to at least engage in the dialogue with this group in the church. This group is so powerful that if one does not respond to its inquiries about one's writings, that one could be even forbidden from, say, celebrating mass in public, or even one could be laicized, or you know, their, their priestly ministry could be taken away from them. And so it's very serious business, we could say, um, in that sense. And in the 80s, there were two documents that came out from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith that were critical of what they called some aspects of liberation theology. The church, in some ways, the church, the hierarchical church, in some ways embraced liberation theology. Though John Paul II, Pope St. John Paul II, was critical of communism famously, and even some people attribute to John Paul II the end of the Soviet Union, um, in some ways, you know, in, in a collaboration, I guess. 
John Paul II also said that liberation theology is urgent and important, you know, and that it should be done. He just critiqued some components of it. The parts that are most critiqued are one, the uh, Marxism, that some liberation theologians quote from Marxist texts and will make arguments that seem Marxist um, and are Marxist uh, in some ways. And that's of great concern to the hierarchical church because, of course, that Catholic social teaching tradition that we referred to earlier has very clear condemnations of communism and has clear condemnations even of democratic socialism as well um, in the sense that we, we would understand it, not in the Leninist you know, sense, um, we could say. So that's problematic um, and from both sides, right? <laughs> So that raises red, literally red flags, I guess, um, from the Vatican, right, when those things are said. The other thing that is important has to do precisely the, with this question of salvation, which is, is salvation primarily a material or a spiritual reality? And when one writes on that, one gets into a lot of trouble. And then also one can get into trouble when writing about the church, as in my most recent uh, podcast, which is Feminist Liberation Ecclesiology with a feminist liberation theologian, uh, Maria Soledad del Biar Tagle from Chile. She addresses this question. One of the original books that was published in Liberation Theology was e e Ecclesiogenesis, or The Birth of a New Church, we could say, by Leonardo Boff, and it was, boom, you know, condemned. <laughs> Because when one writes about the church, it is a polemic. It's a polemic because one is saying sometimes that the church should change its hierarchical structures or at least should consult more widely with the broader church, uh, with lay people. And this deals with questions of power in the church, right? Is that, and of course, leads to the question that's addressed in the podcast of clerical sexual abuse. You know, when priests have power and authority, special authority is given to priests that power can be and often is abused. So all of these questions are important. So there's a number of critiques that come from within the church about liberation theology, and those may be the most uh, important ones. Critiques about the way that liberation theology understands church, the way that liberation theology uses Marxism, the way that liberation theology understands salvation as a material reality. Yeah, thank you for that answer, David. Um, the next question, I feel like you already answered, but I'm still gonna still wanted to see if you wanted to add anything new to it. Sure. Is, uh, from Marquia, uh, why do you think Christians often default to more conservative capitalist principles? Is it because of their upbringing or something? Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say for me, I think that's true. In in that in my you know in the moments of more conservatism in my life, I would say, or when I have the temptation to that. I think it comes from that. I would say my parents, uh, God bless them, wonderful people, and, uh, and I love them very much. I do think, though, something that I was taught, which I think was negative, was about this kind of success mentality that is, goes to the core of what it is to live the American dream, right? And so sometimes we have visions for our families, which are good visions. Uh, we want people to have their basic material needs. We want them to be fulfilled human beings. But at the same time, sometimes it leads to a certain individualism, right? I think of the competitiveness that I found in my upbringing, competitiveness that comes from mainly two areas, sports and academics. <laughs> and I think that these are so toxic unfortunately, right? Because in sports, it's like a zero sum game, right? And then also in academics, oh, the competitiveness uh, that is fueled by that. And of course, competitiveness is taught as a virtue in capitalism, right? The competitiveness is that which keeps the wheel of the economy spinning. And so we're taught that not only about economics, but about sports, about politics, about um, education. And ultimately, we need to be moving towards a greater space of solidarity. And that principle of solidarity um, rages against that. And then also, of course, we have the principle, you know, in socialist circles that we speak about of revolution, 
right? Which is precisely challenging uh, the competitiveness, right? But it's, it, 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 it's in its own way a competitiveness. This is one of the dialectical approaches to Marx and Engels, which is that, or Fanon put this very clearly as well, is that capitalism has created a Manichaean world, right? Rich, poor, uh, black, white, um, these different categories that are understood and put in opposition to each other. And one of the things that happens with that is that it also primes the pumps for revolution because when classes are pitted against each other and framed in the contradictions of capital, that is precisely that which spins history towards a revolution, right? That can move towards a greater moment of solidarity. So yeah, I think upbringing has tons to do with it. A great book for that is um, To Be a Revolutionary by Guadalupe Carney, Father Guadalupe Carney SJ, who I mentioned before, who dedicates about a third of the book to his upbringing and how it was a channel to be ideologized uh, into capitalism. And he explains it very well, much better than I could ever do. Great, next question is up from Matthew. Um, in your view, how does theology add to leftist politics and vice versa, how does leftist politics add to theology? Yes. Well. I think that what leftist politics does for theology, which is a very good thing, is that it keeps us rooted in historical reality, right? Sometimes theology wants to go into these esoteric spaces. And theology, according to liberation theology, is about struggle. Liberation theology is theological reflection on struggle. And A. Korea put this well, too. The Catholic Church and the elements of the Catholic Church that have participated in liberation theology are oftentimes behind our contemporaries who are on the left. Communist, socialist organizers are oftentimes much more advanced than Catholic uh, leftists. Not even not always the case, but it's sometimes the case. And so we need to learn from that and ally ourselves with that. Now, vice versa. Just as there is dogmatism in religion and leftist critique can expose the dogmatisms of religion and does it very well, so too, I think sometimes there are dogmatisms on the left and on the political left, uh, sometimes on the Marxist left. And some of these dogmatisms, I think, lead to Sanwal and others, what we were discussing about these uh, soundbite quotes that we get about religion being the opiate of the masses and whatnot, which again, like I say, is that's how it is for most of the case, but it doesn't have to be that way. And so that requires a certain imagination, right, to a certain imagination and creativity. And I think that theology sometimes can provide that imagination and creativity that leads to uh, an anti-dogmatism. Uh, which could be beneficial to the revolutionary left. Additionally, um, I would say that maybe something that um, religious folks can learn from the revolutionary left, which would be a very uh, important, important quality, we could say, um, would be the emphasis on the human person. So I think sometimes in theology, we speak about a theocentrism or a Christocentrism. And of course, in a way, of course, God and Christ are at the center of our faith. But why did Jesus say that he came? He said that I have come not to be served, but to serve. That's a curious statement from Jesus, because sometimes people think we're Jesus, Jesus worship. <laughs> we worship Jesus, and we do worship Jesus um, in an important way, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said that he came to serve us, not for us to serve him. It's just the words of Jesus. So Jesus had an anthropocentrism, right? So sometimes theology can get lost in this theocentrism, but there should be a dialectic between Theo and Andro, <laughs> Uh, so I think that that's a little bit of what the revolutionary left helps us to see. I think yeah. Sanwal, I can, I have a time for maybe one or yeah, two more right. and then, yeah, uh, let's see. Let me just go through, um, scroll. All right. Uh, this one may be good for resources. Let's see. 
uh, 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 do you have any recommended like writings or anything that people can uh, refer to and uh, you know like, read about liberation theology more? Yes, and and I would say that you know looking let look at the books behind me. <laughs> this would be the great thing. So the one above my right shoulder, uh, Mysterium Liberationis. This is the text that we're going through on the Liberation Theology podcast. It's a systematic uh, conceptualization of the fundal, fundamental precepts of liberation theology. So if one wants a general overview of liberation theology from multiple perspectives, pick up that book. And that book has chapters on different topics. So like it has a chapter on liberation theology and Marxism, liberation theology and Catholic social teaching. So it has, it's like something for everyone. You know, it's like the fun fair. You can like find in there something that you want to read. Um, then I would yep. say the books that are directly above um, would be a few important ones. To be a revolutionary is huge. Again, over my right so shoulder, this journey of Father Guadalupe Carney from that conservative Midwestern upbringing, which I'm sure that folks in Philadelphia might be able to resonate with to some degree. And um, that book is a great book for that. And then Blood and Ink, another one behind me, which tells the story of St. Oscar Romero and the Jesuit martyrs of the Central American University, and basically explains why their ink led to the spilling of their blood, mm -hmm. right? What were they writing about that got them killed? Great. All right. Um, I think I'm going to stop it just because we've already over time and just don't want to take any more of your time. Uh, now, where can people follow you, David? I mean, there's a Liberation Theology podcast. Where else can they follow you and your work? Sure. Yeah. So I think that the principal one would be, uh, you know, Twitter is where I really communicate and get the word out about the Liberation Theology podcast. So at Lib Theo podcast. Also, there's an Instagram page at the same handle, um, Lib Theo podcast. We also have a YouTube channel. And um, of course, one, I mean, one can look at my page at Xavier University, which has some of my research. The other book uh, over my left shoulder is my first book, uh, La Fragua which is about a revolutionary Honduran theater. And I have an upcoming book as well, which is about, um, it's a comprehensive study of Honduran cinema from a political perspective. So I go through the history of Honduran cinema and analyze it um, as to what it has to say about the sovereignty of peoples and what it has to say about the Honduran political situation. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been such a great um, discussion. And uh, for anybody who wanted to refer back to this, this is going to go on Philly DSA's YouTube channel. I'll post it on Twitter and I'll tag David's uh, uh, Twitter handle if anybody wanted to refer back to it. And yeah, you know, thank you so much for, for joining us. This has been so good. Um, and we hope to you know have you back soon, back again sometime to talk about anything you want to talk about. That'd be great. Uh, you're welcome. Right. And thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah. All right, good night, everyone. everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>